Now listen up. Coming to you from a toddler's playroom in the Lone Star State. Ooh. Welcome to Health, Wealth, and a Taste of History, where we ramble and you listen. And you listen. Bringing you weird history, food science, and the facts you didn't know you needed. Here are your hosts, Bob and Tom. Hey, historians. This episode, we're going to do things a little differently, and we're going to have an interview. We have a very special guest with us today that I served in the United States Army with for a few years, and that has been a family friend of Bob and I for even longer. Joining us is Major Patrick Sorensen. To us, he's just Pat, though. I've known Pat since late 2014. We first met when he came to my unit and took over as the company commander. As one of the senior non-commissioned officers in the unit, he quickly built a strong working relationship. Pat was really easy to work with as a commander, and was always very receptive of input from those around him. As time went on, we went from strictly a professional relationship to becoming friends. This can be complicated in the military, as officer NCO friendships are somewhat frowned upon, especially when both are in the same unit. We initially bonded over tattoos and fish tanks. At the time, I didn't have any tattoos, but I really wanted to get started. And through talking to Pat, I found out that he was an incredibly creative guy and had been working on the side as a tattoo artist trying to get better and better. I saw this as a golden opportunity. I wanted some tattoos, and he wanted to get better at his craft. So we would talk about all kinds of geeky stuff, as we're both kind of undercover nerds. One of the biggest things we would talk about was fish tanks and aquariums. I was an avid fan of saltwater fish tanks and had been running them for years. Pat, on the other hand, was a planted freshwater tank guy. We butted heads on which was better, but ultimately shared the love of the craft and the art and what goes into sustaining such a tiny ecosystem and making it beautiful. So a little bit about Pat. He grew up in the Emerald Triangle of Northern California. For those of you that don't know, that's the marijuana capital of the U.S. He attended Humboldt State University and graduated with a chemistry degree. He joined the Army as a 68 Kilo, which is a medical laboratory specialist. And from there, for a time, he worked at the United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, also known as USAM, right? I know that's a mouthful. That's the one in Fort Detrick, Maryland, where the movie Outbreak was filmed, if you were wondering. And it's also one of the places where the U.S. keeps some of the most dangerous pathogens in the world, like smallpox, anthrax, stuff like that. He worked his way as an enlisted guy, becoming a non-commissioned officer, and then decided he should move on to bigger and better things as a commissioned officer in the Army. He attended Ooh. officer candidate school, and the Army, in their infinite wisdom, decided to make him a signal officer. He has been a signal officer until very recently, moving all around the world and serving two combat tours in Afghanistan. He is currently serving as a Functional Area 58, which is an Enterprise Marketing and Behavioral Economics Officer at the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Does all that sound about right to you, Pat? Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> So let's kind of get talking about you. So what was it like growing up in the Emerald Triangle up there in Northern California? Yeah, that's a, you know, that's an interesting one, especially being a military guy um, growing up in the Emerald Triangle. So for those who don't know, that's uh, the three counties, Humboldt, Del Norton, Mendocino counties in the North Pacific coast of California. Um, so it's a pretty interesting area. One, because... It's pretty unpopulated. There's not a lot of large towns there. Uh, but what's more interesting is that on the coast, it's a temperate rainforest, meaning it's got lots of rain, like 10 months a year, but it never gets that hot. So it's a temperate rainforest. Mm -hmm. Now, once you go over the coastal range of those areas, so that's about 60 to 70 miles inland from the coast, over that first set of mountains, in the summertime, it gets really nice and hot. So you're getting a really nice hot summer, but not so hot that it'll scorch things. So you're talking the mid nineties to the low hundreds, um, on a nice, you know, several months out the summer. Mm -hmm. And that is, of course, perfect conditions to grow marijuana. Hell so yeah. <laughs> that humble Del Norte Mendocino area is called the Emerald Triangle. And it started there, I believe, maybe a intersection of the location 
uh, which generally had a fair amount of water despite the hot summers, uh, the perfect growing conditions, and then also just the liberal atmosphere. Gotcha. And so you kind of have a little bit of a funny story growing up. You kind of grew up like on a mountain in the middle of nowhere, right? Uh, yeah. So, you know, my parents, uh, well, my mom, my mom, I say was a hippie mm-hmm. and, and my dad, I guess I call him a mountain man or maybe he's not quite a hippie because he's Native American. So he's allowed to be like that. You know, I don't know if that's off color, but they were definitely into the more natural uh, aspects of life. Mm-hmm. So organic eating and, you know, getting back to nature and things like that. Uh, so, yeah, we moved out uh, out to Humboldt County, uh, this uh, property on the hill. And that was when I was about nine or ten years old. We got the property out there. And uh We'll just say it was in the heart of, of marijuana country. So all my neighbors were pot farmers. And this is back in the 90s, uh, you know, before it was all legalized. So these guys were out there blazing trails in the marijuana industry. So, yeah, it was a pretty interesting upbringing uh, out there for sure. Yeah, I kind of always kind of look at that area and think, you know, more like Appalachia, you know, than California, you know. So. Yeah, no, you're, you're spot on there, Bob. And, uh, you know. My my uh, thought on the matter is if they split California in half, that the Northern California would have all the natural beauty mm-hmm. and cool things to do outdoors. And then Southern California would have all the big cities and industry and money. So kind of both sides of the coin would, would be struggling if they split. So what made you go to chemistry like in college, right? So, yeah, this is kind of a weird story. So, uh, even starting back in elementary, but uh, definitely in high school, I always excelled in my science courses, math and chemistry and things like that. So I did enjoy it. Um, but one year in particular, so this was my first junior year. Um, I was living out there in Humboldt County and we actually got snowed in for, and I missed just about the majority of the second half of my junior year. And so we were literally stuck on the mountain and, it, and we were pretty low income. So we couldn't just like pay someone to come plow it. And so we were, uh, we were up there for a few months and we had plenty of, plenty of stored oats and rice and, and things like that. But it was definitely not the conditions that would be conducive to driving to school daily. Yeah. Uh, so you, I think parents, you told me that you had like a, it was like 13 miles to the nearest paved road from your house, right? Yeah, there was two ways you could go. You could go the good way, and these are both dirt roads, but you could go two ways. You could go the good way, which about two-thirds of it was through Forest Service land, so the roads were more maintained. That was about 13 and a half miles to the nearest paved road. And then you can go Haslam Road. And that that ended at this property of these folks called the Haslams. And we just called it that. Uh, but we'll just say that none of that was on any kind of public land, and there was potholes galore. In fact, you know, my dad enlisted my brother and I a lot of those summers to go patch the roads with gravel. Um, So, you know, we'd have to do some of that work just so that it was drivable. But it was a pretty awful condition. So getting back to the story, why did I major in chemistry? Well, that uh, winter that I was snowed in uh, up on the mountain, I was very bored. So this was my junior year. My brother had already gone off to college. My little sister and I were several years apart, so we didn't really, you know, hang out as friends much. Mm-hmm. And so I was up on the mountain board, and I found this old chemistry book because my mom and dad hoarded books just for reading material. And I literally got bored, and I went through it and taught myself all the chemistry in the book, and I memorized the periodic table. Um, and I just thought it was cool. So after that, I was like, I'm going to major in chemistry. Um, but... That's also like, you know, there's all kinds of reasons. I'm I'm kind of a sporadic kind of guy. Um, I would say probably my my biggest interest has been art from a very young age. And so I always wanted to major in art. Um, But then I didn't think it would be a very good choice because everyone told me I'd never make any money at it. Um, So that that's probably the reason Uh, between, you know, the interest in the sciences and that that awful winter up on the mountain getting a little bit obsessed with chemistry. That's, those are probably the reasons why I decided to major in chemistry. And this is all pre internet. And, and you guys didn't have any kind of access up there at all anyway, did you? Well, you know, that's a, that's a funny story because we had probably one of the first cellular phones. Wow. 
And, you know, I, I have to call it a cellular phone, not a cell phone, mm -hmm. because this was, and in fact, maybe I should call it a car phone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had the Motorola, <laughs> and, yeah, we had this Motorola car phone and it came in this, this black leather case that looked like a King James Bible, <laughs> the little Velcro strap that came off and it had a regular, you know, full size hand, you know, telephone yeah. uh, set. And you'd have to talk on this thing. You had this big antenna you mounted on the roof of the car or maybe the roof of the house, wherever you were at. And uh, that thing actually worked like a charm. So what's interesting is the cell phones we have now, you know, if you're not within pretty close range of a cell tower, you're not getting your signal. Mm -hmm. But this thing, we were out there in the mountains, and I'm pretty sure miles and miles from the nearest tower. But that thing, you know, you could you can make a call the, to a tower that's probably 20, 30 miles away. <laughs> Well, you probably had pretty decent service since you were up on a mountain, mm -hmm. too. Yeah, I'm sure there wasn't much interference back then in the early days of cellular telephony. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> the Army. Why the Army? So, you know, as I said earlier, in my, in my wisdom, I decided to major in chemistry so I could get a real job after college rather than mm -hmm. art and be, you know, poor and broke in my parents' basement. So... Well, I was pretty dumb about that, actually, because I couldn't find a good job after graduating uh, with my degree in chemistry. Part of that's my own fault. I was uh, not exactly focused in my studies. I mean, I did well. I, I got A's and B's in almost all of my science courses. Mm -hmm. But, you know, super uninteresting things like English and sociology and all these required under division classes, I barely passed with C's. So my GPA was, was not the best. And so, of course, that meant I probably wasn't looking at going to a decent grad program after my undergrad. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I try not to make too many excuses for it, but just going to college was the success. I didn't really have much mentorship in the way of what to do with my education. And so I didn't really realize the second and third order effects of what happens after you finish uh, your mm -hmm. undergraduate degree. Yeah, that was kind of the finish so, line that you didn't really look past until it... Mm -hmm. You got to it. Until it came up on me, yeah. And so I was like, okay, cool. Well, I've got this degree. You know, I'm about to graduate in a couple months, so let me find a nice chemistry job. And so being from California, the places I looked was the San Francisco area, Sacramento area, down in the Bay Area. There was a lot of uh, industry down there for chemistry. And there were actually a few jobs listings that I might have been able to get. And they started between forty to 50000 a year, mm -hmm. which – for me back then, a poor kid from Northern California, I was like, that's a lot of money. But as you do, I started doing my research and I was like, wait, so I'm going to be paying 2800 a month for a studio apartment? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's not as much money as it sounds like. And so, you know, what, you know, after I wasn't uh, able to find the job I thought I was going to be able to find in, you know, a, an area I could afford to live, I thought, well, let me just see about getting my loans paid off. And so I, in the end, I decided to join the army using the loan repayment program. Mm -hmm. I figured I'd do a few years in the army, have a steady income, although not great, and get my loans paid off. And in the meantime, I could figure out what I was going to do with my life. Yeah. yeah. Seems fair enough. Seems Great like plan. a good idea. And how did you choose to be a lab tech or was that something that the army recruiters and guys kind of steered you in that direction? So I didn't really know much about the army. And so, you know, I went in and I took the ASVAB and I did, did well on it. So I was basically able to pick any job I wanted. And so they asked me about my background. I told them I was getting my degree in chemistry and they said, Oh, well then maybe you should pick like medic or lab tech or dental tech. They kind of pointed me toward the, the life science type MOSs. So, yeah, that was the reason I picked uh, lab tech because it was kind of the most related to chemistry. Uh, the basics of that, you know, of course, are um, laboratory chemistry in a hospital and then uh, phlebotomy. Um, and those are the two major things that the, that MOS will do. But, of course, there's a lot of other sub duties and jobs you can do as a 68 kilo. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until after I was in AIT, Advanced Individual Training, for those who are listening, which is kind of like you go through basic training. And that's where they teach you how to be a basic soldier. And then AIT is where you learn how to do the job that you're going to do in the Army. Mm -hmm. So I was in AIT learning to be a lab tech. 
and I found out about the Papa Nine program, which is uh, uh, ASI or Advanced Skill Identifier. Uh, and if you have that, you can do medical research. Um, and so to do that um, ASI, you had to have a degree in the life sciences, which I did. So, so it was actually only after I joined and I was already in my training that I found out about the kind of the specialty um, work that I could do. Oh, cool. So with that ASI, was that extra schooling or was that just they gave it to you based on the fact that you had the degree already? Um, yeah, so they, it was that you had the degree already. And if I recall correctly, there were certain core courses that you must have accomplished in that degree okay. with, you know, at least D grade or better or something like that. And then they basically just waved a magic wand and said, now you're a Papa Nine. Now you're eligible to go research stuff. Yep. Now let's talk about the good stuff. Let's talk about the movie Outbreak. So you end up at USAMRID, the UN, United States Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Disease. God, they make up some long-ass yeah. names. Everyone just calls it USAMRID or RID. RID. Is what we call them. Uh, yeah. Heading over to the RID. Yep. So what was that yep. like, man? Working at that place. So it's interesting because that, you know, was my first taste of the Army. And I thought this is what the Army's like. You know, I'll, we'll talk later after I became an officer and went to the real army with the combat arms unit. But this was a pretty laid back unit. So we did do physical training in the morning. We'd go there, do our PT and exercise. And then we'd report to work at nine. And the first thing we do is take off our jacket and put on a lab coat. And we'd be working in a lab all day. And we were off at four o'clock every day. So I didn't really understand the, the army tempo in that job but it was really pretty interesting so that place had super tight security so even when you go on base they're like searching every car looking underneath with mirrors they have dogs running around checking the checking for any odors or things you might be smuggling mm -hmm. so they, they they have you know they take it very seriously the security of that base and then it's even more security when you get into the building where we did all that work so we of course had to have special badges and uh, door codes to get through every door. Um, and it was, you know, very tight security. So they could tell any room you went through where you were going. If you went in one room and you piggyback through a door with someone else and then you scanned another door, there would be a flag. They'd know that you hadn't scanned correctly. So they took it very seriously, making sure they knew uh, who was allowed in the building, where everyone went, and that everyone was following the correct procedures to, you know, of course, ensure the safety of the, uh, of the program there. So what kind of stuff did they have you doing? What do you do as a lab tech at an infectious disease center? So there's a lot of really interesting research and projects that were going on there. But if I had to characterize myself, I'd say that I was a bacteria librarian. Mm -hmm. And so that sounds kind of weird because there's no such thing as a bacteria librarian. But in my, in, in my job, there was. Um, so what we did is we ran a bunch of different assays to type bacteria based on characteristics so that we could understand all the possible different pathogenic bacteria that we knew of. And the hypothetical case would be if, you know, some nasty bug showed up somewhere in the world, we could go run a sample on it and say, oh, well, you know, we know this is just the anthrax that's normal flora in the bisons and the you know the plains so anyway so so of course the the purpose of that studying was so if we found a bacteria somewhere in the world we'd be able to identify it and figure out the source of it maybe it's something that's just natural from the environment or it could flag as something potentially part of some sort of biological weapon but of course we can't really get into the details of any of that we'll just suffice it to say that we kept a very big library so that we could understand a lot of the different dangerous bacteria that exist in the world. Gotcha. And so I know they they do testing on animals as well there. Were you a part of that or was that like a different section of the center? So that was a different section of the center. And I never uh, had the opportunity to do any of that research. But yeah, I mean, there was all kinds of testing going on. Everything from mice and rats to guinea pigs to even green macaques. And so all kinds of really interesting projects. I guess it could be a little bit sad depending on your opinion on it. But, you know, I think the, the research that was being done there was really valuable uh, in improving our, our national defense 
posture as well as understanding some of these really uh, dangerous diseases. Mm -hmm. I would say that probably most of the people who are listening right now don't realize back during that time that you were there and before just how terrified this nation was of biological weapons. Uh, not that we're not scared today. You just don't hear about it as much. But at that time, that was probably one of the most top things talked about. So, you know, something to note of about you, Samrit, again, aside from it being, in, you know, kind of the basis for that movie outbreak was you guys remember the anthrax scares that happened mm -hmm. and that yeah. they were all associated with this guy named Dr. Bruce Ivins. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Ivins worked at USAMRIT. So he was one of the anthrax um, doctors. He was working, you know, on, on all kinds of different studies there. Now, again, you know, there's all kinds of different opinions about what happened. He kind of got blamed for certain things. My opinion, without getting into detail, is that he kind of got blamed for things that were probably outside of his purview. Yeah. So a lot of people blamed him for the release of, uh, you know, some some sorts of pathogens out of the lab. But I, I really don't think so. I mean, the man was a man of science. He, he dedicated yeah. his life to it. And it's just really, you know, I guess the, the, the talking point there is that when you're working in this kind of environment, it's a very high stakes game mm -hmm. and you just have to be very careful everything you do. So everything we did there, you know, we did a lot of really great projects, but everything was very slow and metered. You know, we were very deliberate about all of our processes, making sure we did uh, proper cataloging and cleaning of workstations between every little uh, test or protocol that we do. Gotcha. So we had talked about this the other day, but there were several like testing methods i guess that you guys use and i think I, i'm gonna butcher the name of this one but polymerase chain reaction pcr so yeah uh, polymerase chain reaction it's a uh, it's actually a really cool technology so uh, basically what you're doing is you're using this protein called polymerase which is the protein that builds dna and you're using it in a petri dish or a test tube uh, to amplify the amount of DNA that's present in a sample so that you can better type it. So what you do is you, you've got your little sample and you wash it is the first step. And the idea of washing is that you're going to wash away the cell membrane and uh, the nucleus of the cell so that the DNA is exposed in, in the sample. And then that goes into a test tube with um, a bunch of nucleic acids so you've got your your four your four important ones A T C G, and those are the the building blocks of DNA. So you put those in the sample, and then you add polymerase to it, and then you you heat it and cool it a bunch of times at specific parameters. And what it does is it makes a bunch of copies of the DNA, and then after that you can use that amplified, um, concentrated solution of DNA. And you can run it through all kinds of different typing mechanisms. And that's where you get that little readout that has all the little bars all across it. Mm -hmm. So then you're looking at all the different genes and alleles um, that are in the sample. And you can type, you can figure out what's, what's, what's in it. You know, you figure out what type of bacteria it is. You figure out what exact mm -hmm. species it is, et cetera. It's kind of like 23andMe or history.com uh, for, for or bacteria. Or yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so it's a really cool technology to be able to look all the way down at the DNA level, and it's being used today uh, for testing a COVID because, you know, there's so many different types of virus, and they're so small yeah. that you have to have some way to amplify the sample so that you can properly measure it. Yeah, in our last episode, Bob brought up the fact that 100, is it 100,000 or 100, either way, it's a lot, 100,000 or 100 million viral particles of coronavirus fit on the head of a pin yeah it's uh just unbelievable how incredibly small we're talking about here with viral particles. yeah the, te the fact uh, that you have technology that can amplify that and see it is crazy to me yeah and you go ahead and think about these viral particles bacteria they've got two probably three billion years of uh, evolution on us Oh yeah, this is these are some pretty. I don't know if you call them you call them life, their life, or you just call yeah. them machines. 
they're living machines. They're just really pretty amazing, even though they're so destructive. Yeah, they're more like the invaders from outer space than anything else, and I think. Yeah, space invaders. If you can look up the uh, some of the uh, drawings of what these things look like, they look like these little. Some of them look like these little spaceships that come down, land on you, and inject you with their DNA or their RNA. And use you and as a host. And use you as a host, and the next thing you know, you become that zombie. What are those things? Those uh, like space polar bears? Have you heard of those things? Oh. It starts with a T, I think. Uh, we'll have to look that up. What the hell are those things called? Well, they're you know they're super tiny and like see through, but in sci fi world, you know what we're talking about, Bob? Uh, the little uh, they're like gummy bears. They look like gummy yes. bears. Tardigrade. Tardigrade. Yeah, yeah. Those little things are called tardigrades. I think there's like Star Trek episodes about those things too. Yeah in the mycelial network of space and time and the universe. Yeah. We got Paul Stamets, you know, getting, getting added into these, these star tracks so that mycelium gets included. Yeah. That's pretty cool. All right. So, Oh, I want to talk a little bit about CRISPR. We were Mm -hmm. talking about this. I'm going to butcher it again. Pollen polymerase chain reaction. So isn't that, the idea of taking a cut of DNA and then amplifying it, isn't that kind of similar to the process that happens with CRISPR, but you're just replacing instead of amplifying, I guess? Or maybe I'm not explaining it right. So, yeah, they're pretty similar. So with, with PCR, you're throwing DNA in a tube, and then you're just copying everything, making a bunch of copies of everything that's in the tube. So with that process, you've got to be super careful that you don't contaminate your solution because if you get the wrong DNA in there, like you get some extra cells from some other bug in your test tube, then you're going to make a bunch of copies of something that you don't even want. And that's incredibly easy to do too. So easy to do. I've done, you know, I've I've had to rerun samples. Of course, you know, of course we have protocols to, to confirm that it's pure after the fact, but anyway, so, but with, uh, with CRISPR, You've got a, a precursor that will align the transcription protein to an exact spot on the DNA chain. So there's some pretty unique segments of DNA um, that can be identified so that you can really zero in on a specific gene or a portion of a gene or even just a portion of DNA, even smaller, that, that's your area of interest. And so that precursor will kind of be like a lock and key where that protein will attach to the DNA and then begin the transcription or the writing or the copying of the DNA in that spot. And so the idea being uh, you could attach right there. And in fact, you can cut the DNA open and you can rewrite starting in a, a specific spot and ending in a specific spot. So the application would be that, you know, of course, there's more research needed to make this happen. Um, in the real world, but you could completely replace a gene with something else. And that's pretty amazing science. Yeah, I mean, the, I can imagine you could do all kinds of stuff with that. You could... Down syndrome. You could pick your baby's eye color, hair yeah. color, height. Do all kinds so, of crazy editing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respectfully disagree on the Down syndrome one, because that's... So trisomy 23, mm. they've got an entire additional chromosome an extra copy of the 23rd chromosome. So that's that's like, that's not at the gene level or the DNA level. That's like a whole long chromosome. I Maybe in theory, eventually it could lead to that, but that's like a big thing. Unlike, you know, if you look at some of the smaller diseases where it's like one wrong recessive, yeah. you know, two, two recessive copies of a trait. Now that's the kind of stuff I think the is on the horizon for leukemia. sure. Leukemia, I believe a form of leukemia the other day that I was reading about that just has to do with one wrong and transcribed gene there somewhere and there's oh, wow. billions though billions of these strands of adenine guanine thymine and what's the other one i'm missing right there but that is we're talking about right mm-hmm. yeah. and to be able to just find that specific one um and the other thing i was thinking about when we were talking about this was uh in the early days about contamination and the early days when there were 
doing genomic research and looking at Neanderthal, the people that believe that, you know, there was no Neanderthal gene DNA on the human side always said, that, well, it's because they contaminated it in some sort of way. But uh, with the new techniques with CRISPR and things changing every day, they find out, yeah, we all probably got just a little bit of uh, Neanderthal DNA in us if we're from certain regions of the world. Yeah, my 23 and me says I have a certain, I think I'm slightly above average, if I remember correctly, <laughs> when I looked at it. I don't know what that means, but no, I'm joking, I got right. a little bit of Neanderthal in there. Yeah, I, I don't remember my amount either, but yeah, I'm hoping I'm with you there with slightly more caveman than average. So, you know, what's really interesting, I think, is in the more cutting edge research having to do with the DNA is looking at epigenetics. So you've got your genetics, which is all your genetic code, and that makes up your whole, you know, all your chromosomes, your whole genome. And then you've got epigenetics. And that's a really interesting field to study because it looks at the difference in expression of different genes. And, you know, of course, creation of proteins its the proteins that do all the work in the cell and the body. But you express different genes based on your environment. So whether that be, you know, external environmental conditions, whether it be your diet, uh, whether it be, you know, you know, if you look at the cellular level, whether you look at the acidity or the, or the temperature down at the, that level, you can express completely different genes. And so that's where they're really digging in now because... Is that where they're looking at super soldiers and that kind of genetic research or is this something totally different? Um, no, I don't know if it's as much about like something like that as it is about you know, they, so for instance, when they look at all of the genetic code of two animals, like we'll say like a, an ape and a human, mm -hmm. and they're like, you know, whatever, like 98% the same, it seems like, and they look at all the genes, they're like, it seems like we're way di more different than just the, the gene differences in our, in our mm -hmm. genomes. One of the theories is that things like epigenetics, where, you know, we have all these different hormonal differences in our bodies. And there can be like cascading effects that unlock genes and different proteins in different ways that create way more differences than are just easily observable by looking at the genetic code alone. No, that's fascinating. That's yeah, that makes so that whole, right now. yeah, it's really mm -hmm. crazy, like way, way above my level of understanding. But it's mm -hmm. it's looking at, you know, what gets expressed and it's looking a lot harder at the proteins that are created, which, of course, are the, the machines that are actually created to do the work in the cells versus right. just looking at you know, this code and thinking it's strictly a recipe book. I remember uh, years ago, a few years, well, I guess to say years ago when I was doing some R&D work, I uh, was at a Illinois University, I believe it was, and they were doing research, a lot of research on uh, phenols, smells, just how, you know, different things smell and what that does to you and your emotional reaction. And so those emotional reactions have a lot to do with just what you were talking about. You have this cascade of different events going on in body, different genes being expressed, different chemicals being made in your body, which would, their, their whole focus was, you know, can we make this cheese or sour cream or yogurt or something smell a little better that's going to make you freaking fall in love with it, and that's what you want to buy. Uh, but... There's a lot more research going on in those kinds of areas, too, that uh, are going on nowadays. Yeah, that's that's pretty exciting. You know, I, I got to do one published research publication in college, and it was nowhere near as interesting as that. Yeah, neither So <laughs> I, had, I had to go out into the Redwood Forest, and I had to collect these millipedes, Nearctodesmus salix millipedes. And they're just these little brown millipedes. And we collected them so that we could test them to see if they, uh, what kind of defensive secretions they had. Because millipedes will squirt that brown juice at you. Yeah, yeah. There's usually a little bit of cyanide in it. And so we collect, I, you know, I spent hours out there in the woods finding these dumb little millipedes. We brought them back, we shook them up in a little vial, and we ran them on the mass spec machine. And then, yep. They secrete cyanide just like every other millipede. That was pretty much the research. Yeah, but you never know. You know, 100 years down the road, that might be the vital key link to something that's going to change the world of medicine. You millipede know? poop is going to yeah. change the world. Yeah, you never know. Yeah. You know. Or the next Botox, and, you know, who knows? Who knows? I mean, you never know what that research is going to lead to, except for mine was colloidal silver, which, by the way, don't drink it. 
It doesn't cure all the stuff they say it does. Don't believe none of that stuff they say. All right. It just turns what, what was the uh, research you did on colloidal silver, Bob? Uh, we were looking at the antimicrobial properties of colloidal silver, and uh, its uses on uh, in the beef industry. Basically, you know, can you spray the carcass down with this uh, uh, liquid? And will it prevent, you know, in E. coli and salmonella and different things like that from growing? And, uh, you know, with my research, we did find that there was about a half a log reduction in E. coli and a log reduction in salmonella. However, you can reinterpret that and just say that, well, it could have just been the, the water. <laughs> that this nano-sized particles of silver were uh, held in suspension and, you know, just washed it off. The cool thing, though, is that you could actually, you, know, you can look at this and it just looked like a bottle of water, right, or a container of water. But if you stick one of those little lasers like you use for the cats that chase them around the room, you know, get them all spun up. If you stick that through one of those little bottles, you will get all these little tiny reflections back. And that's the uh, uh, laser light uh, photons spinning those nanometer, nanometer sized particles of silver around in there. So, oh, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's got a little spectacle to it. You know, what did they, what did they call that back in the 1800s? Uh, snake oil salesman, right? Yeah. Yeah. You had to have a little celebration of what was going on with this product, and it's going to make you feel much better and cure everything in the world from cancer to uh, to AIDS. Which, if you look at some of those websites out there, these people are saying that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But, you know, at least back then, you know, people didn't know any better because they thought they thought they were still just curing the four humors. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're getting a little off subject here, but it's kind of cool stuff. <laughs> All right. So um, since you guys were nerding out a little hard, let's move on to your officer time. So you're doing all this work in lab tech. Uh, presumably, I guess you enjoyed it. You seemed like you enjoyed the time that you did. Why become an officer? Was it basically just better money, better retirement, opportunity? What what was your kind of thinking going into that? So going into it, you know, there was two things. Uh, it was definitely the money. Um, I wanted to make a lot more money than what I was making as a sergeant. Um, and then also it was just kind of to advance my career and maybe do even more interesting things. So I applied to become a medical service corps officer, which is still in line with my studies, being in the life sciences. But, you know, I later found out um, that there were a lot of different reasons in where they branch you in the Army. And things are getting better these days, but at least when I, I transitioned back in 2006, it was more or less the needs of the Army, along with the recommendation of the board, which is a group of senior officers who judge your merits and recommend where you, you would best serve in the Army. Uh, so when I went to my OCS board, um, I did fairly well, I think. And uh, I think the board members saw promise in me. What I didn't really realize or know at the time until looking back on it was that they were all signal officers themselves. Mm. Because at Fort Detrick there, along with the research unit where I worked, there were a lot of signal units on base. And that was where they were able to find a bunch of majors to do the board. So they, they thought I was a good guy, and they were all signal officers, so they all recommended Signal Corps, and that's that's what happened. Yeah, I guess that makes a lot of sense. Hey, if we got a promising candidate, let's bring him into our cool guy club. Well, that brought you into our lives, so yeah, it was meant to be. So you become a signal officer, um, and then your first assignment after all your signal training was Fort Lewis, correct? Correct. I went uh, across the country from Maryland to Fort Lewis, uh, now called Joint Base Lewis McCord, Washington. And I was on, there's two sides of base, one's further west, right on the water, and that was uh, North Fort Lewis. And I was there in 8th Squadron, 1st U.S. Cavalry. And that was the cavalry squadron within uh, 2nd ID, 2nd Brigade, Striker Brigade Combat Team. So my brigade was an infantry unit that used strikers, and then I was in the cavalry unit within that infantry brigade. And so I was assigned there as the S6, which is the signal officer. Mm -hmm. So, of course, as a signal officer, I oversaw everything in the, uh, in the squadron, uh, having to do with radios and computers and networks and things of that nature. 
You're listening to Health, Wealth, and a Taste of History with Bob and Tom. We'll be right back. Hey, uh, without going hugely into detail, could you tell me, listeners are out there, um, what the modern cavalry is? Because I think most people probably don't think about the Westerns and guys on horses. Yeah, so, you know, uh, cavalry originally was the, the people that were mounted on horses, of course, uh, a few hundred years ago. And the modern cavalry, sometimes they have basically the same kind of armament and vehicles mm-hmm. as the other units, like the infantry units, but it's really their task and purpose that's mm-hmm. a little bit different. So uh, generally they have slightly lighter, uh, quicker vehicles that have a little bit more readiness to go across terrain. And the cavalry will go out ahead of the main unit to do scouting. So at least with, with the cavalry unit I was in, you know, we would go out and set, send up, set up outposts, listening posts or observation posts, so that we could see, theoretically, the enemy coming. Um, and then we could send back reports so that the brigade was ready to react. Very cool. Yeah, so that the main force could come in and do their thing. Yeah. And that's not something that's just limited to the U.S. Army. That's most of the major army or militaries in the world now. Right. And so, you know, for us, although, you know, in if you compare this to the old days, we should be on horses. We were all using the same strikers. Um, but we did have uh, a few more of the strikers that were outfitted with better communications equipment. So we had a few of the kind of special strikers that had more radios. Um, and better communication so that we could go be those scouts and do a better job of reporting back to headquarters. Yeah. You also get that very, very cool cavalry hat. Yeah, you get the awesome uniform. cowboy hat. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, what I learned is when you show up to a cav unit, you, of course, have to buy a Stetson because you got to be one of, the, one of the, you know, in the group. Now, the young guys have to earn the Stetson. Uh, the officers, we just have to go buy one and wear it. But we still have to earn our spurs. Now, with, with the Stetson, you have to break it in. And so what I learned on my first uh, officer outing event, we went out and had a hail and farewell. And I had, of course, wear my Stetson for the first time. Well, guess what? The first time I set it down on the table, they filled the entire thing up with beer, and I had to finish <laughs> it. And that's called breaking in a Stetson. Uh, yeah, there's all, all kinds of little weird traditions in the military. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are better than others, let's just say. Okay, so you finish your time at Lewis. Well, actually, you, that's from Lewis is when you deployed twice, right, to Afghanistan? Uh, no, so or my no, first deployment... First time um, was from Lewis, second time was later on, yeah. Right, so the first deployment, I, uh, we went to uh, Kandahar City, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, we were at Camp Nathan Smith. So that was right in the heart of Kandahar City, which is one of the biggest cities in Afghanistan. And now I use the term city loosely. Um, There was a a very small central portion that was, you know, fairly modern. There were some decent buildings with marble staircases and kind of nice stuff. But a lot of the city, I'd say 80 to 90 percent of the city was very crude mud huts. But, you know, you're talking in the in the cold season when everyone comes back in you're talking a few million people living there uh, but yeah it was a very uh very interesting place uh-huh. yeah you, you leave the country and you go someplace like that uh, you come back with a profound respect for what we have here definitely 100 percent agree um you know we went to, but you know they have some things that are pretty amazing there um, they have these melons that are just so delicious. I don't know what they are, but they're something like a cross between a, a honeydew and something else. But they're just the biggest, sweetest, juiciest melons you'll ever have. Yeah. And actually, the area is really well known for pomegranates. Mm. The pomegranates are so good there in Afghanistan. The food, I think, in the Middle East is fantastic. And, and the people, generally speaking, are, are extremely, extremely nice. Yeah, you know, I had I had one... It was a simultaneously great and bad experience with food there. Mm -hmm. So we went on this key leader engagement uh, to the home of this guy named Haji Tourjan. And so he was kind of a, I guess you'd call him somewhat of a warlord. I think he'd made his money 
uh, when the Soviets had come uh, through a few decades prior. So he was a pretty wealthy guy in the area, and he, we contracted with him to provide private security around our camp. And so we'd go there and interact with him and, you know, talk about different political things in the Kandahar city area. Well, we went there and, of course, enjoyed a feast, as, as you do when you visit a key leader's house. And they made this really delicious rice. I, I can't quite describe how it tasted, but it was kind of like seasoned and toasted. And it had cinnamon and nutmeg flavors all through it. It was a little bit spicy, so delicious. Mm-hmm. And they also did a lot of kebabs. And then there was, you know, fruit and vegetables and just a whole spread of delicious food. And they made foot bread for us, which I'll let Thomas go into detail about what foot bread is. But it was quite delicious. It was somewhat like non bread if you've ever been to Indian food. Yeah. And it was one of the most enjoyable meals I ever had. But starting about 24 hours later, for nine days, I had the Montezuma's Revenge. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I figured, you know, Bob, with your expertise, you could probably talk more about it. Um, they told me that they think uh, it wasn't the, the cooked food that was the problem, but it was the fact that I'd eaten the raw fruit. Yeah, probably hadn't been quite washed in the manner that we would do it here. Um, you know, if it was washed at all, uh, there's no telling what could have been on that. But, yeah, we had yeah, a was... lot of people getting sick. I mean... Most people that went over there would would get sick within the first two or three months, but foodborne illness was just huge, huge. We're going out in town and picking up stuff and eating out there, or being you know given something on the street, and you don't want to you know be rude to anybody. Uh, so you know you you take it and you pop it in your mouth and go, oh yeah, that was great, even if it was just the most horrible thing you ever put in your mouth before. Uh, and, Indeed. Uh, yeah, twenty four hours later, you're. Now, with uh, how quick that happened, though, um, and the duration, uh, I wouldn't, you know, usually when you eat something and it's three or four hours, you can pretty well bet it's some kind of a toxin, usually bath or something like that. But uh, 24 hours and then hanging on for nine days is probably some type of bacteria going inside of your body, taking over your intestinal tract. (laughs) Oh, yeah, it it was pretty rough. All right, so let's move on a little bit. So you spent some time at Fort Lewis, and then you came to Fort Hood, which is where we ended up meeting. Um, And that was your company commander time. So what was it like being a company commander? Uh, Yeah, so company command was pretty cool. It was kind of like the best job and the worst job. So it's kind of exciting. So for any military members listening out there, I'm sure you all remember how cool and amazing it feels when you like teach a young private something new Um, just because you know it's fulfilling it's just like being a teacher and you teach a kids you know a new math problem Um, and as a company commander you're responsible for 146 souls in my case and it was kind of great having that opportunity to interact with the young soldiers and hopefully teach them a thing or two and because of your position uh, they look up to you a lot so it's just kind of a really good feeling you know to be in that position. Uh, but unfortunately, along with that comes a lot of hardships and difficulties and downright pain in the butt uh, activities that you have to put up with. So, um, so yeah, definitely have a few stories. I don't know, you know, how, how many of those you want to get into, uh, but there's a few good ones. Well, I mean, let's, uh, we can bring up one. Let's okay. About so the biggest ass pain about being a commander so the biggest ass pain about being a commander is you've got to uphold a certain level of respect and dignity with everyone regardless of the situation so i'm not going to go into great detail here for the protection of the innocent but we'll just say that on one particular occasion a young woman came into my first sergeant's office and then also wanted to speak with me. So my first sergeant is my battle buddy in command, and he's the senior NCO, whereas I'm the commander, NCO officer pair. So we're the two seniors. And this spouse wanted to speak to us, and she wanted to have us help her out and explain to her why her husband wasn't pleasing her properly in the bedroom. 
So as you might imagine, that was a very delicate situation and it was quite hard to handle it professionally. Really all we could do was sit there and listen to her vent to us and because, you know, nothing illegal had happened. There was nothing to do to the soldier to, you know, air quotes, get him in trouble. Um, but yet, you know, as the commander and the first sergeant, you're kind of obliged to care for the soldiers in your unit, which extends to their families. And so we basically just had to listen to this woman talk for about an hour and a half. Jesus. So there's a lot of situations like that that come up. I don't, know, I don't know if I could keep a straight face in that situation. Good thing I never had to do that. But, yeah, I mean, I, I know, as as being one of the NCOs in that unit, I know a lot of the crazy-ass stories that came up. I mean, shit, soldiers punching police horses downtown and all kinds of other crazy goodies, but we won't get into some of that. Yeah, so, you know, to sum it up, I'd just say uh, your time either as a company commander or even just at the company level in the army, you're going to come away with it with some of the best stories of your life, both good and bad. You had your company commander time and all this fun stuff. And then um, you applied for and got selected for the arm, one of the armies. I don't know how many they have, but one of the army's grad school programs, right? Uh, yeah, it's called the performance based grad school incentive program. So sounds like a big convoluted thing, but it's basically you put in this packet um, and it is a little bit competitive. So they compare, you know, the, I guess the worthiness of all the applicants and there's so many slots given out per branch. So me being a signal officer, there was four slots for signal that year. And then if you're selected, you get to go to grad school and it's a full ride. Uh, they pay, uh, you know, they pay all your tuition for you. And they continue to pay you your army pay and uh, housing allowance and all that stuff. So it was a really great opportunity for 18 months to take a knee from kind uh, of take a knee from the army and to uh, further my education. And this even counts towards your retirement time. And oh yeah, you're getting paid the whole time, and you're still accruing time in service toward retirement. It was it was amazing. One of the best things that's happened to me in the army. Absolutely. So at this point, you've gotten the Army to repay your loans for your undergrad, and now they've gone ahead and paid in full your grad school. So that's not a bad deal so far. Yeah, it's pretty good. And you know what? So so there is a downside uh, to going to the grad school program. You owe three days for of service to every one day you go to grad school. So my 18 months of grad school translates to four and a half more years that I have to work in the army before I can get out of the army. But for me, as someone who wanted to stay in the army, that's not even a downside. So mm -hmm. what you're telling me is army is that you have to keep employing me for four and a half years. Great. That takes you up to close to the 20 year retirement, doesn't it? Or does it not? Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, it'll get me up close to there, mm -hmm. but remember at the time I was, uh, you know, still a mid-level captain, and I hadn't made promotion yet. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, on the officer side of the Army, it's a little bit harder to stay in for 20 years. So if you don't make enough rank, you're kind of forced to separate and go find other work. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that cutoff of making the major promotion hadn't happened yet. And so, yeah, for there, it was kind of like hedging my bets that I could at least stay in longer if I needed to as a captain while I figured out the next step. And you get this great uh, master's degree that you can carry around with you for the rest of your life. Yep, I've got it in my backpack right now. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, I was fortunate enough to be, uh, they, they do the same thing with the warrants, and I was fortunate enough to get that same program, and it was just fantastic. It's one of the things that put me to where I am today. So after grad school, you got a pretty cool assignment. You ended up going over to Japan. Uh, yeah. So, you know, my my last position before I came here to New York was I was the network operations chief for United States Army Japan. So what that means is I was in charge of all of the current operations and things going on having to do with computer networks for all of the army units in Japan. So it's pretty, pretty cool position. And it sounds very big and exciting. And you hear U.S. Army Japan. It's 
a two-star headquarters. So there's a two-star general that is in charge of the whole thing, which is a pretty big unit in the army. But when I got there, I found out that there was only four green suit soldiers in my S6 shop. So it was actually quite small. And the rest were civilians or contractors? Yeah, we had about 12 uh, DA civilians and contractors. So, funny story, you ended up on Camp Zama, which is where U.S. Army Japan headquarters is, and that's actually where I met my wife when my parents uh, moved me there halfway through my senior year. And that post is a tiny, dinky little place. It's like the golf course is literally like half the size of the installation. But the cool thing oh, yeah. about it is you're like a really short train ride away from downtown Tokyo, and there's all kinds of stuff to do. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's probably the most amazing thing. Oh, go ahead, Bo. No, no, I was just going to say, let you know how chance plays in life, is uh, I was actually supposed to be PCS to leave the country a year before that, uh, before Jenna and Thomas met, but I was allowed to extend for one year so Jenna could finish up her high school, and that's when they met. You know, yeah, that's even even now when I was there, several years after you were there, uh, it's pretty renowned how good the school system is there overseas, um, and it seemed like the, all the parents were pretty happy with the program they had there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's fantastic. You know, small class size, uh, the kids are in a overseas environment that is uh, somewhat unlike any place else in the world, you know. Um, felt fairly safe with them uh, going out into the environment in Tokyo. Uh, they used the trains. They had lots of friends that were from actually all over the world. There were several international schools in Tokyo, and the Dodd School, the DOD school there, would do um, intramural sports with them, and then they had all kinds of other activities. But uh, my uh, my kids still have friends today that, and, and they're thirty that they still keep in contact with that they met over there. Japan was a pretty cool place. Um, I think the biggest pain in the ass of being over there is just the time difference. Trying to talk to family when it's like a thirteen-hour difference can. Or watching sports can be a little frustrating sometimes. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Or if you're, you know, if you're a, a stock investor, um, you know, the the tickers shut down while you're awake, or you have to stay up late. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that, but that's a good point. Yeah, you've only gotten a certain a certain time window to work with. Yep. Yeah, like at night before you go to bed, and early morning. Mm -hmm. So you did some pretty cool stuff over there in Japan, man. Uh, you learned how to use katanas, didn't you? Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, while I was there, I did about four or five months of Iaido. I don't remember the exact translation. It probably doesn't translate correctly. But it's it's more about kind of being in line with, uh, with the world than it is about anything else. And it's not really considered a combat um, practice. It's more of an art form. So the best thing to compare it to, I would say, is the kata forms that you do in, in karate, not the sparring itself, but more of the kata. So you're learning these routines on how to properly handle the sword. And it's uh, really quite interesting. You know, when I, when I first got there, you know, of course, I heard all the stories of what you have to do in Japan. And one of them being climb Mount Fuji and another one being you got to get a katana. So I guess everyone comes home with one. Well, I thought, you know, it might be better if I at least learn some of the basics about the katana so that when I'm showing my cool souvenir off to people, I can at least talk about it a little bit. So, you know, I never had any grand plans of becoming a sword master, but it was, it was really quite cool. And I got the opportunity to do a little festival performance uh, at the, at the town nearby at the Zamas high school. Um, so it was, it was a pretty fun experience. That's pretty awesome man and then one of the other cool things you got to do was get uh some tattoos done some traditional japanese tattoos right with the the pokey stick what's that thing called yeah so it's it's called tabori and uh so you know people confuse it a little bit with the polynesian style of traditional tattooing so uh, with tabori you've got um, your needles extending forward along a long shaft and so the the shaft is poked into your skin and then there's a slight lift and then pull back 
and that's kind of the motion and you do that over and over again um, and that's how the ink is uh, put under the skin so yeah it was a really intense process so we had a we did a mixture you know i worked with my uh, artist uh, horiso and we decided to go with modern machines for the line work and the black and gray because we could get a lot more smooth gradation than is really possible with the uh, the traditional tools so we did that for the black and gray and then all the color work of the peonies and the rock flowers we did um, using the tabori style so it really created a pretty uh, amazing amazing look and then the the other thing that i really like about this tattoo is we picked a color palette that really well matched the colors that would have been used back in the Edo period. So, you know, I've got this cool tattoo. It's very simple, uh, but it, you know, it kind of reflects the, the style and the art that you would have seen a few hundred years ago. What time period was that Edo period? Do you know? I should. Let me look it up and then we can re-record. <laughs> I'm sorry. That, that just popped in my head there, Alan. I, I should know. My first year in college, I took uh, a keto uh, for a semester, and Bobby took it with me, and uh, that was we had a lot of fun with that. That was really cool. And I always said when uh, for the four years that I was in Japan, I was going to learn more, but never did. Yeah, so the the Edo period uh, is also called sometimes the Tokugawa period, um, and it was between 1603 and 1868. Um, they call it the Tokugawa because that was under the rule of Tokugawa shogunate. You know, so it was a pretty uh, interesting time. That's pretty awesome, man. You know about the uh, katana sticks. When I was in Japan, I uh, this location that I was working at, we had several uh, uh, Japanese women that were working with us, and, and they were in their late fifties, probably early sixties, and. Uh, one afternoon during a luncheon, they did a demonstration with the katanas. They were both teachers. You just, oh, just, wow. just wasn't something that you would typically expect of like a 60 year old, 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 old grandmother or something like that, you know, because they were just the sweetest, nicest. Anything I say is going to sound bad, but they were just the sweetest, nicest little ladies you ever seen. And they could beat the living shit out of you with this stick before you even knew it. Yeah, don't mess with old granny. No. She'll slice you up real quick. <laughs> yeah, and you know, uh, my sensei, when I was doing the Iaido training, he was this 72-year-old guy, and he used to be a professional dancer for the majority of his adult life. That was his career. Wow. And then in retirement, he decides to become an Iaido master. <laughs> Man. Yeah, his name is Fujiwara-san. Fujiwara-san. Uh, for those of you that don't know, San is like the customary thing that you put at the end of every name when you're in Japan. So whatever your last name is, if you're Smith, you're Smith-san. Yep. Let's move on to where you're at now, man. So now you're at the famed Military Academy at West Point. And you're doing this new program, right? This Army Marketing? It's like this brand new, well, not brand new idea. The idea's kind of been around for a while. But it's a brand new spin on marketing, right? Correct. So, uh, yeah, this is a, you know, I got selected in part of the inaugural class of functional area 58 officers. So the names changed a few times, uh, but uh, now I think they've settled on enterprise marketing and behavioral economics. Um, so the idea is we're kind of a special skills group that's charged with uh, developing and maintaining and overseeing the national marketing campaigns for the army. So of course, a, a lot of what we do is outsourced to a company called DDB and they've got this massive $10 billion contract spanning over 10 years to do all the like advertising and other marketing activities. And then we're really there to oversee it uh, as well as make sure that we inject some army logic to it. Cause a lot of times if you outsource something to be done for any institution, if that outsourced company doesn't have direct knowledge of the, you know, culture of that institution, then sometimes they don't get things quite right. So that's kind of what we're there to do as well. Gotcha. And we were talking about the other day, one of the other ideas that I guess you or your teams are looking into is admissions at West Point, right? Because it's a very tough competition to get into West Point. 
Right. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm stationed here at West Point, although I am, you know, my job title works on the national campaign level. My current position here is to really work specifically with the admissions department of West Point. Um, now, we're using marketing in kind of a different way than you might in some other organizations because of the fact that at West Point, there's already a very huge demand. We have a very strong brand presence of Army institutions and commissioning paths. West Point's the most well-known. And we get about 15,000 applicants a year, but we can only offer roughly 1,250 seats uh, to the program for each class. So it's a pretty stiff competition. So, you know, of course, we still want to do marketing activities, and we still want to make sure that we're bringing in the highest quality candidates possible into the program, because that's, of course, going to be the future leaders of our Army. But what happens... Um, to the other 14,000 or so that don't get admitted. That's one of the things uh, you brought up is that we're trying to market at the best of what's left and partner them with other ROTC programs across the country, right? Something along those lines? Exactly. So, you know, of the 15,000, we'll narrow it down to say, you know, after going through the wickets of qualifying, uh, so that includes, you know, medical health screenings, as well as just their basic like grade point average and having conducted enough extracurricular activities and things that would qualify them for, you know, physical fitness, it narrows down. And we'll say there's a pool of a few thousand remaining out of the 15,000 that try to get in. Um, from there, uh, we accept the 1,250. And then there's also this pool, a little bit smaller, that we'll call uh, QNS. Uh, they're qualified non-selects. So that means they really, they met all the minimum standards to go to West Point, but they just didn't quite cut it. So a lot of times their GPA was a little lower than another kid, or maybe their physical fitness wasn't quite as strong, mm -hmm. or they didn't excel in as many extracurricular activities. So their file just wasn't quite as strong as another applicant. But they're still very high quality, um, could definitely get into a top tier school across the country. And so our goal would be to take those kids and try to, you know, encourage them to go into an ROTC program so that they could still, you know, achieve their goal of becoming an officer in the Army um, and getting a, a top-notch education as well. Awesome, man. That sounds like really good stuff. So I think we talked enough about your career. Um, what do you do yep. to de-stress? So you're obviously, I know, Bob knows, everybody that's been in the military knows the the military as a whole can be stressful and you're working long hours a lot of times. So what is it that you do to take that stress away? So, you know, it really comes down to the environment at home. So, you know, I do a lot of things like just about everybody else does I love to just relax and watch Netflix and uh, hang out with the wife and the puppies. Uh, but I'd say like my hobbies and activities that I like to do to de-stress kind of revolve mostly around gardening. And so that's everything from doing kind of the landscaping in the front yard uh, to uh, growing uh, organic vegetable garden in the back, as well as doing uh, aquatic gardening in my fish tanks. That's awesome, man. I know we've talked a lot about gardening, and I know you're like a super nerd when it comes to plants. So what can we talk a little bit about some of the farming techniques? Uh, I know we brought up like lasagna, composting, hugu culture, the root stout method. Can we talk to talk about those and so people can understand kind of what we're talking about yeah so you know uh, gardening is all about uh, of course setting the right um, conditions in the substrate which is a term for the soil that the plants are growing in and so to do that it's a combination of uh, how easily the roots can get into the ground as well as the moisture content and then of course the nutrients in the soil itself Kind of all those things. And then a little bit to do with the temperature. Um, and so, you know, I've, I'm very interested in gardening. So I've done a little bit of research and found what works best for me to be able to do organic gardening with no added pesticides or heavy fertilization um, is to use some of the, the easy techniques that just work well. And so I, I'd say that probably my favorite technique is the Ruth Stout method. And so Ruth Stout was this really cool lady who developed this style of gardening. And what she did is she said, if you just take old hay 
from the you know the farmer next door their hay that got left out in the, in the rain and is rotten and you just lay that out in a thick layer over the ground you can just plant your seeds right on the ground and you don't even have to do any digging mm-hmm. that's kind of her her method the Ruth Stout method so I've kind of used a, a a version of the root stout method. So I kind of changed it a little bit because I wanted to be able to use the materials that I had at hand because I don't have a farm right next door. So what I do is I collect all the grass clippings and the leaf droppings every year and I compost those in the back and I use those to make a layer over my garden. And they do a really good job of providing uh, organic material as well as mulching to keep the moisture in and the worms happy. And then also, you know, your, your leaves and your grass aren't going to the dump. That's awesome, man. Uh, that's a really green way of thinking. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to talk yeah. about was um, we were having this discussion the other day. We were talking about fung- fungus, oh, yeah, right? I forget what it was called. I'm going to butcher the name anyway. Mycorrhizal. Mycorrhizal. Mycor, something like that. Mycorrhizal fungus, yeah. yeah. So that's really interesting. So, um, you know, fungus is a really, really interesting um, life form. And uh, it's it's been around for thousands and thousands of years, uh, much longer than any any kind of like mammals or anything. Um, even plants, it's been around for, for a long time. Bob, I don't know if you know the, the history on fungus. Uh, but Probably close to more close to like a billion years or so in some of the uh, first actual terrestrial plants, land plants, where actually fungus is and where they got... Uh, you know, mushrooms the size of trees. Wow, that's amazing. So so the interest for me in the mycorrhizal fungus and kind of these mushrooms in general is their symbiotic relationship in the soil uh, with the bacteria and with the plants. So these fungus will actually kind of grow together with the plant roots, and they're really amazing in that they allow the plants to extend their distance that they can collect nutrients uh, and water uh, from in the, in the ground. So when you cultivate a good um, environment for this fungus to grow, it's actually really great for your garden. And so that leads me to another gardening style, which is called hugel culture. And I think that's probably the best way to uh, cultivate and promote the growth of this uh, fungus. Doesn't, I mean, Trees and plants and stuff can kind of commu- communicate with each other through these funguses as well, I think. like they, they kind of know when predators are around or they can share resources. But um, let's get further into what you call it, hugel culture? Yeah, hugel culture, uh, I, I guess, was just uh, first created by Germans. Um, I don't know the exact history on it, but that's the term hugel culture is a German word. And uh, it's really interesting. So it's it's another way to use the materials that you have on hand and to create a nice uh, environment for your plants to grow. So it's really pretty simple. You dig a trench. So you're doing a little bit of digging. Um, you dig a trench and then you fill it up with old logs and uh, pr- preferably rotten wood. And then over the top of that, you can put uh, grass clippings and uh, leaf litter and smaller sticks and then on top of that, you pile the dirt that came out of your trench and it makes a mound. And so uh, what the whole concept is there is that you've got this layer at the bottom, which is all this uh, cellulose material, which is what the majority of the wood is. And that's a perfect colony. Uh, it's a perfect place for the fungus to colonize. Um, and so what that does is the fungus is breaking down that wood and releasing nitrogen nitrogen into the soil and then it also makes a great reservoir for water so you can minimize the amount of water you have to do on your garden it's really a pretty amazing uh, technique and i've done it a few times with great success can we talk a little bit about uh coffee i I know you yeah you've recently turned into a bit of a coffee nerd right or coffee snob yeah i guess uh you could call me a coffee snob so when i was in japan to go back to that story my boss was a espresso master and so he kind of took me under his wing and taught me the way uh the only problem is now i'm hopelessly addicted to espresso drinks um and so the reason uh that i can no longer go to starbucks is because i know better so you know at starbucks you know i think they do a pretty good job for a global uh, business of sourcing their beans and getting the you know product to the consumer 
but they kind of miss out the fine details of a fine uh, cappuccino in their endeavor to create a streamlined process that keeps all the customers happy. Insane. Um, so yeah, they, I think, I think their coffee is a little bit burnt and uh, they, they definitely overheat their milk. Mm-hmm. So what does this do to the milk? And what, why is it burnt? What's the right temperature? Okay. So, you know, when you're pro- uh, when you're properly frothing milk, what you're trying to do is uh, create a foam of fine bubbles and you're really looking for what you would describe as a silky texture rather than like a foam on the top uh, with milk underneath. And that silky texture is almost like just a light, airy, um, thickened milk. And so to do that, uh, you actually only want to heat it up to 60 degrees Celsius. Hmm. Uh, And the reason you do that is because it's the perfect temperature for all of the important components of the milk. So at that temperature, the sugar is released a little more openly into solution. So when you drink it, you can actually taste the natural sweetness of the milk. And then also 60 degrees is also the perfect temperature for the proteins to get loosened up in the milk. And that allows nucleation of the small air bubbles with protein around the outside. So you get a nice consistent foam and it won't break. So normally when you go to a coffee shop and you get a a coffee that's over 60 degrees, the protein starts to break down which can kind of give it a burnt kind of buttery taste. Um, but then also you, you just get the foam at the top. It's kind of like airy. And then you get, you know, you get a fairly flat drink underneath. Hmm. So you get, uh, I know they had this um, same sort of situation when you, when you pasteurize the milk. Um, like you said, the 60 degrees Celsius, that was about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. If you, if you get the milk, too hot uh, you're going to start to make the proteins in it um, curdle and you'll get some more flavors and taste the sugars will basically caramelize so that's going to cause some bad flavors and taste but when you you have the the proteins uh, not expand properly like what you're trying to do is make this foam matrix on the top um, you want to keep that temperature down like you said, to around 60 degrees or so. Now that's, that was interesting to me to me because I wasn't sure exactly what the temperature was, but I am going to carry that along with me from now on. Yeah. And so, you know, my understanding is that, you know, if you go to a place, you know, like a chain, like Starbucks or something, it's no, it's no, you know, knock on them. The problem is, is the customers complaining about their coffee not being hot. So they yeah. heat it up beyond that so that the coffee stays longer while they're getting to their destination or until they, they drink it. Um, so it's just, you know, that is what it is, I guess. And the, the, you know, the other thing I really like about heating it to that 60 degree mark is that as soon as you pour it in the cup, it's the perfect temperature to drink. You're not going to burn your mouth, but it's not cold. It's perfect. Yeah. I hate that coffee where you're going to put it in your mouth and it pulls off the top layer of skin, you know, on the top roof okay. of your mouth. It just, yeah, you're, yeah. You're, you're sacrificing some of the roof of your mouth <laughs> yeah. to the coffee guys just to get it down. But yeah, we're turning into somewhat of a coffee snobs ourselves. We are now traveling a good 20 miles to go and find uh, good coffee beans. Uh, and it's, a, it's amazing. Uh, you can, once you start doing this, you really taste a difference and it's hard to go back, isn't it? Yeah, it sure is. But you know, I'm, I, I still consider myself a young Padawan in the ways of the cappuccino because I'm still <laughs> learning how to do the uh, the latte art. I'm not that good at it. And you think I would be as an artist, but I'm struggling. So I'm, I've got more to learn. So you carrying a thermometer with you when you make that uh, cappuccino yeah. or is it more of a art where you just kind of like, so, uh, finger in there? so my pitcher does have one of those little uh, automatic uh, thermometers on the side. It's like a thermometer uh, sticker. Oh, cool. Um, like you've seen maybe on the side of a fish tank. Yeah. Um, but I've kind of learned, to do it by feel as well. So when I hold the pitcher, it's 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 kind of funny because it's very fancy. You put your pinky on the bottom of the pitcher, mm-hmm. and you can kind of feel when it gets the right temperature. And it's right a, right about before it feels like it's going to burn you. It's like oh. just about the perfect temperature, but you kind of get a feel for it after time. <laughs> and you're a Padawan, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy <laughs> stuff, man. Well. I'm glad we got a chance to talk. I'm glad we got to talk about kind of your career and your background and talk about all kinds of crazy subjects. And uh, great talking to you. And uh, 
uh, I love what you're doing with the show and definitely interested in uh, tuning into your future episodes. Pat, let me ask you something real quick, Nick. Is your wife, she's uh, big into nutrition as well, right? Uh, yeah. So, you know, in college, uh, she studied uh, foods and nutrition, dietetics. Uh, so she's kind of got a chemistry degree, too, but with the, kind of the angle toward nutrition. And then she's a personal trainer, so she's got lots of different certifications. She'd be a great person, I think, to have on in the future as well, you know, and talk about nutrition and exercise. And... I'm sure she'd be a perfect person to get into the uh, weeds on nutrition. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Pam. All right, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. All right. You've been listening to Health, Wealth, and a Taste of History with Bob and Tom. That was radical! The number one audio production for people with nothing better to do. That was amazing. For more info, head over to healthwealthandhistory.com. Thanks for listening, and until next time.